In this week's In Ear Insights, let's talk about people for a bit. We've been talking about a lot of process and certainly a lot of technology recently with things around artificial intelligence and all these crazy cool things it does. But at a talk I was doing last week, uh, one of the attendees asked, is there genuine risk with the use of AI that it's going to make us lazy and stupid and reduce the quality of uh work that we do as human beings and will it basically make us uh as bad as uh you know untrained people because we're going to be over reliant on these systems so katie are we on a path to lazy and stupid i mean here's here's the thing there is no path people are already lazy and stupid <clears throat> and the second they find even more excuses to be lazy and stupid they're all over it and so there's you know it's the whole there's two kinds of people and I feel like artificial intelligence is not a new, it's not solving a new problem. It's just a new technology. Um, you're always going to have people who are looking for shortcuts, people who are looking for the easy way to do things, people who can do the least amount of work. And so artificial intelligence is now just a new version of that. Um, and so if you have team members who are already prone to working that way, that it, I mean, that's just going to be a problem. Humans, by nature, you know, if we don't want to do something, we're not going to do something. And we'll try to find something or someone to do it for us. Um, you know, whether it's we just don't want to, we don't have the time, we don't have the resources, whatever the thing is, there's always someone else willing to do it. And that's the case with artificial intelligence. So in a, in a long-winded way, Chris, to answer your question, it is a real risk because it already exists. Um, you know, we take automation for granted. We take other, you know, services and tools and things that do stuff for us for granted. We're just like, oh, it's just going to do it anyway. So I don't even have to think about it. I don't have to program it. I don't have to maintain it. It does the thing for me. Um, very simple example, you know, think about a coffee maker. So it makes your coffee for you, but you still have to clean the machine. You have to set up the machine. You have to set the machine. And if you don't take care of the machine, the machine will stop making coffee for you. But you're like, oh, no, it just does the thing. And then you get frustrated and it's, you know, you can sit, you treat it like it's disposable. But like, well, I'm just going to throw it out and get a new one because you are too lazy to maintain the thing that you have and actually do the work. Um, so, yeah, I think that we're already there as a society, as a culture, as uh, professionals, we're already lazy and stupid. Well, that doesn't sort of bode well for... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it was good news. I, I, know it's, I know it's not good news, but this is something that there's a, a, an interesting piece in the, in the Associated Press the other day uh, about the ease of uh, now doing deep fakes and, cl and voice cloning and stuff mm -hmm. means that um, but again, because people are inherently less likely to do work that they don't want to do, uh, things like fact checking uh, have pretty much gone out the window. Uh, if you hear, you know, if I voice cloned you, for example, Kate, and I and and uh, I, I decided to roll out this podcast to you saying, oh, and our our next uh, our next strategic focus will be burning down uh, Microsoft's uh, campus, right? It would sound like you. It's clearly not something you would ever say. Um, but absent automated ways to check for that, there's no way to to validate that. In fact, that was not you saying such a thing. Um, there was an example, and there've been examples. I I, I did an example um, with a group of friends. Um, you can make very credible sort of uh, I don't know how to say it's like hostage calls, right? It's, uh, someone you know saying you know help, I've been taken hostage. Please send money to X uh, account, and they'll let me go. Um, with people's voices and again if you don't have the technology to check for that to to validate that it's real or not you could end up being fooled by this so now it's i wouldn't call it late that in those cases lazy and stupid that's more not having access to tools that would allow you to validate something but these are all considerations with ai in the context um of this previous conversation it was about service providers so does the use of that tool create worse service experiences if, if a company is employing people who use ai rampantly for everything mm -hmm. does that does that 
diminish the service that people that people give it doesn't have to it's going to but it doesn't have to and i think it's going to be really easy to blame the technology for the dip in you know the quality of service the quality of work uh because the, it, you know the technology can't fight back and be like hey i'm only doing what you told me to do but that's exactly what's going to happen and so if you think about you know we've had conversations about you know, the risk with large learning models is people, humans are training them and they're introducing their own personal biases into these things. It's the exact same with introducing, you know, artificial intelligence to, you know, handle customer service, to write content, to do whatever the thing is. We only have ourselves to blame as humans if it doesn't work out the way we want it to work out because we are the ones responsible for training it. And so if, you know, an organization sees generative AI as a solution to their, you know, writing staff problem. Okay, maybe it's like 50% of the way of the solution, but it's not the full solution. But what will end up happening is they'll be like, great, we're just going to have chat GPT crank out 100 blog posts, we don't need to hire writers. And then the quality is going to go down, their SEO is going to suffer, they're going to lose audience, you know, so on, and so forth, the ripple effect. And they're going to blame the technology, not the fact that they themselves failed to put proper guardrails around the technology. I guess my question though is if you have machines at a mediocre level, right? Mm -hmm. They can cre they can create mediocre content, but 40% of your staff is at at underperforming level or or you know not competent level. By the use of that those machines either with people or without people, doesn't that solve that problem to get you at least to mediocre? So sort of it, it, the, sort of the rising tide lifts at least the lowest boats. Um, doesn't that improve the, the, the general quality of, of the uh, service you're delivering? Not if you have the underperformers programming the machines. Well, they wouldn't be programming. They would just be using it as, as line workers. But I mean, and so there's a lot of dependencies in this answer, but, you know, it depends on, you know, do they know what they're doing or are they just doing the bare minimum with it? Are they using the technology to its full potential? Um, are they maintaining it in such a way that it's learning and enhancing? Or are they just saying, great, I don't have to do my job anymore. This thing's going to do it for me. And the end user, the customer is still very frustrated with the overall service they're getting from this company. And so... I don't think that's an improvement at all if the end user is still unhappy with the service they're getting. But they'd be less unhappy with it because instead of 40% of the time being enraged, 40% uh, of the time they'd just be dissatisfied. Because you're, that, you're no. That, that to me is not success. <laughs> that's, I mean, you're still failing. It, it, but it's an improvement. I, I feel like we're splitting hairs because that, like, someone being you know, enraged and moving up to dissatisfied, like they're still unhappy with you and they're still mm -hmm. going to walk away from you. And so unless you can get your, you know, subpar employees and mediocre technology to actually turn it around and have satisfied customers, I don't think it's a win. Okay. This, because this comes back to a, a situation that uh, a friend of mine who works in a call center <clears throat> is having where uh, it's funny. She works at a, a financial institution and her, she is measured on call time. Like that is the, the outcome of her job is, is she has to call something no longer than five minutes, every second over five minutes, she's penalized for it to the point where, you know, she gets called into reviews because her whole, her call times are, are sometimes well over five minutes because, Sometimes you can't solve a problem in five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and this company has said, yes, it's nice that your customers are happy with you, but you're, you're on the phone too long. And so we're, we're probably going to have to let you go. This is a company where the, their success metric is five minutes. Their success metric is not a happy customer. They don't care about a happy customer. They care about efficient workers. In that case, you, if you swapped out that person for artificial intelligence that essentially was tuned to handle a problem in five minutes or less, or... It didn't matter because you didn't have to pay them wages and healthcare. You could have the calls go on for however long somebody wanted to, as long as you know it was within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, isn't that an, imp an improvement? For, isn't that success from the company's perspective? Even though the customer, like you said, it's the customer is still unhappy, but this is a company that clearly does not care if the customer is happy or not. I mean, it's such a bullshit question because it's the wrong success metric. 
to us if, because we're a company that likes happy customers, but this is a company that does not like happy customers. I mean, and, and that's that company's prerogative. And so if they, and so, and that's the thing. So if you're asking me, it's not successful. If you're asking whoever's setting the metrics in that company, sure, that probably works. They can, you know, churn through as many unhappy customers as they want. They can lose as much money as they feel like and get rid of people who are actually helping them retain happy customers. Sure. If you want to call that success, that's great. And, and so in that case, going back to where we started with this, the use of artificial intelligence would help them achieve their, their success goals. And so in terms of diminishing the experience the, the the customer experience it it clearly will in this case but this is a company and i don't think this company is alone in its kind of distorted view of the world um that customer satisfaction doesn't really matter it it's reducing labor costs and and hold you know specific windows of service is what matters to them i mean but if that's the case then why have customer su support at all or why not just have the line go dead at, at the five minute mark? I mean, if they don't care about happy customers, you don't need to introduce artificial intelligence to piss people <laughs> off even more. I mean, that's the thing that I don't fully understand. I mean, obviously, I have almost zero context to this information. But thinking about it, you know, from an outsider, if your goal is to churn through as many customers and calls, you don't need artificial intelligence for that. You would just, you know, have some sort of a you know, predictive chat bot set up to answer some basic questions or, you know, point people to an FAQs page on your website and never give them contact information, which is probably the most frustrating thing to a consumer. Um, but you as the company then don't have to hear from them. Like there's other ways to handle it without investing in really expensive technology if your measure of success is not a happy customer. And, and again, this is a this is a it's a credit card company. So they, I'm not sure why they have a customer service department in the first place. But part of their part of their success metrics too, is um, is keeping com customers in as much debt as possible, uh, and by not solving their problems. So then again, why would you introduce? I know we're sort of going around in circles, but <laughs> right. to me, this is the you know is artificial intelligence the right technology? The answer in that case is no. If their goal is to keep people in debt and keep them unhappy and keep them tied into a credit card that they forgot they signed up for when they were 19 years old and never paid off, then don't even have customer support. Like, just get rid of it altogether and problem solved. Like, that to me is, it's ridiculous. But if that's the success measure, then don't introduce new technology that could theoretically solve people's problems. True. I, yeah, I, I can't say. I don't know anyone in the leadership of this company, so I can't. I, I don't know what's going on in their heads. But in those in these cases where you have where you have call them strategic imperatives that don't necessarily make a whole lot of sense to from a customer's point of view, artificial intelligence will be very appealing to to the leaderships of these organizations because they will see it as a way to dramatically cut costs um, to and to replace as many humans as possible. And I, I have to wonder if there's an aspect of, you know, going back to the original question, if we see rampant use of AI not only affecting people's individual abilities, mm -hmm. but affecting strategic decisions, you know, I think that's, I almost think that's more probable where, where someone, you know, the company we used to work for, um, you know, was run by bean counters. I'm sure that, you know, no offense if you're an accountant listening to this, uh, but they cared literally about nothing except net net margin. And if they could reduce the workforce by 40%, I think they would have immediately. Well, think about this. So when was the last time you opened a physical encyclopedia? Mm, about a month ago. Okay, so you're an anomaly. Um, <laughs> from the average person's perspective, you know, a lot of us grew up, that was the only way you could find out the answer to a question was to op was to go to a library, find the right volume, look it up in the encyclopedia, figure out that didn't answer your question, and then go, you know, searching in a different volume. And that would take some time. Now that we have, you know, search engines and smart devices, we can just yell, 
at the smart device, you know, what's the answer to this question? We don't even have to get up from where we're sitting to get the answer to a question that would have, you know, otherwise taken us, you know, a few hours to get. And so does that make us more lazy or does that just make the information more efficient? And the answer is kind of both. Um, you know, it depends on how you want your information. And so to what you were saying, Chris, it has taken out our ability or our desire to fact check. And so in a way that does kind of make us lazy because we're just sort of taking whatever the first answer is at the top of the search engine and saying, okay, great. That's my answer. I don't need to look any further. Um, you know, when we think about things like, you know, what are the top 10 best SEO practices? And then we, you know, put that into a search engine. People often just take whatever comes up first because that's the one that happens to be the best optimized for SEO, ironically, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the correct one. And so I think technology has a tendency to make us a little bit more lazy. Uh, all of us, even those of us who enjoy working hard. What we need to do is figure out where are we okay with the technology taking on aspects of our lives so that we can then focus on the things that we care about more. So I was having this conversation. I don't remember where I was having this conversation, but the conversation was, um, you know, if technology could sort of take over everything, what would I, what would be left for me? And it's like, great. I still want to be in my garden, phys physically putting my hands in the dirt and feeling that. And someone made the comment like, well, you know, at some point, like robots can do that for us. Like, great. I still want to do that for myself. And so we as humans, we as companies have to make those choices of strategically what makes sense? What do we still want the humans to be responsible for? And it should be things like customer service. It should be things like relationship management. It should be things like people management. It should be things like, you know, making decisions about the company. Those are the things that we should still want to have humans in charge of, but as we've talked about on past episodes, artificial intelligence is going to be able to do all of that for us. So it's more, it comes down to a choice. I will say at least on the customer service side, um, as, as um, an AI advocate, I think the nuance there is whether or not your service is already good. Right? If, you're, if your customer service is good, then yeah, replacing it with a mediocre automated solution is probably not the right choice because mm -hmm. it's, it, it's definitely, you'd be, it'd be a step down. But if your customer service is appalling, <clears throat> replacing it with mediocre would be a step up. Yeah. Well, and again, that comes down to, there has to be some self-awareness in terms of the company. There needs to be, you know, you need to know if you're offering, you know, shitty customer service or not, or if you even care. Um, if you already have stellar customer service, your customers are happy, your employees are happy to be helping customers, introducing artificial intelligence could be too much of a disruption. Um, even if you feel like it's going to, you know, save money and be more efficient, you know, that's not a question of laziness. Um, that's a question of, you know, strategic imperatives to your point, Chris, of, is this the right decision for us? You know, do we want to replace something that's working so well and people are happy uh, with artificial intelligence? The answer is, I don't know. You may want to start small and maybe have it run in parallel. Um, but if you already have sort of a mediocre call center and nobody's happy and, you know, all the customers are unhappy, sure, introduce artificial intelligence, outsource a bunch of it, and people will still be unhappy. It's not going to change anything except maybe the, you know, bottom line of your profit and loss sheet. Right. And uh, perhaps this is a different show entirely, but how do you get leaders to think more holistically and more strategically instead of saying, <clears throat> well, this is going to save us 14% on, you know, wages and benefits are 80% of our budget. And so if we can save, you know, 40% on that, we will be 40% more profitable. Um, and if you look back, for example, at the pandemic, almost every tech company misread the room dramatically overhired and then three years later two years three years later was having to cut staff left and right you know ten thousand layoffs fifty thousand layoffs the 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 headlines were full of that this the last 18 months <clears throat> the only company that didn't was apple 
Apple's like, yeah, we're not hiring anybody at the, you know, the beginning of the pandemic. And then when they came out on the other side, yeah, we don't have to fire anybody because we didn't, we, we read the situation correctly and took a more conservative strategy to just keep on with business as usual. How do you, how do you teach people to approach, to think about AI more strategically? Because I think that's the issue here is it's not people are lazy. I mean, yes, the people are lazy. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's nature. It's, how do we help people understand that AI is part of a strategy that it may be a tiny part, maybe a big part, but it has to factor into the big picture because I don't think people are seeing the big picture. I think they're they're seeing the shiny object right, and not what the object does. I mean, that is a whole different show because you're <laughs> talking about changing behaviors, changing people, um, getting them to see... I mean, it's going to be different for everybody. It's going to be different for every company because artificial intelligence isn't a one size fits all solution. Um, for We're going to use it differently from a company who is similar to us, but doesn't do exactly the same thing or have the same set of skills within their team members. And so it's, there's a lot of work to be done up front of really understanding the business inside and out and sort of what you want the goals to be and where there are deficiencies and where things are working well. And so there's, you know, it, there's no one answer to that. And I do think that that is probably a different conversation um, because it also comes down to the personality of the decision makers of, you know, are they even open to hearing about the people or are they just looking at the bottom line? If they're just looking at the bottom line, there's no point in having the conversation because you're not going to convince them otherwise. Mm -hmm. So for managers who are concerned that their employees are going to become just sort of lazy drones with AI, what, what guidance do you give those managers? It might be okay. Um, if you have a bunch of C and D players um, it might be okay for artificial intelligence to come in and take over some of their responsibilities because one of two things will happen. One is it will light a fire under the people who need that motivation or two, you will have the attrition that happens with bringing in that new technology to take over responsibilities um, and both are okay. And so it, you as a manager have to decide can I take the risk of losing half my team to artificial intelligence? If the answer is yes, then go for it. If the answer is no, um, then you need to figure out why that is before introducing the technology. What if the answer is I don't know? Then I think, again, there's more homework to do. Artificial intelligence isn't a decision that you should be taking lightly in terms of replacing humans. Um, so if the answer is I don't know, then you need to dig deeper is I don't know because you're afraid of losing people. Is it because you're worried about cost? Then you need to start doing some proof of concepts instead, instead of going full in. So figure out like one task, one responsibility, uh, one full-time employee, figure out what that looks like. And, you know, is it going to work? What about on the, on the customer side? So let's say I'm a patient of a medical practice, right? And I have, I don't know, a resident that's, that's treating me. It's called, say it's a teaching hospital. Um, <clears throat> how should I be thinking about the use of AI? Because I can see a couple of different angles to this, right? On the one hand, you have the, oh, per, the, you know, people naturally will take the lazy route. The person will simply consult the machine and, and right or wrong. That's, you know, the answers I get. On the other hand, I think for folks who are who understand nuance more, there could be a, well, this could provide a useful second opinion, right? That, mm -hmm. you know, without necessarily having to rope in a, a second human doctor uh, th that could perhaps add something to the conversation. How, how do we think about this as customers? Well, you know, and I, I do think we're going down a little bit of a rabbit hole, but um, you know, I, as I've mentioned, you know, numerous times I've done, the clinical trial research and one of the clinical trials we were running was are people more honest to a computer than they in than they are to a human in a healthcare setting and the answer was overwhelmingly yes um and so there are ways to introduce the technology where it's not taking away from that human interaction 
but the computers can be gathering the information, can be sort of putting together, you know, its recommendations to give to the physical healthcare provider to say, this is what I got from, you know, your intake, or this is what I got from the assessment. Let's now talk about what this means for you as the patient. So there's ways to introduce it, that, to make healthcare more efficient without taking away from that one-on-one experience. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about it is using it as an intake mechanism um, so that you get different answers than you would from a, say a nurse taking the same information. You got to read my clinical trial research, Chris. This is what I did for a decade. <laughs> Literally that exact thing. Well, we'll have to put it up on the uh, Trust Insights website <laughs> somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> uh, and, and maybe perhaps maybe do an, an episode about AI in healthcare because I think there's there's some there'd be some interesting rat holes to, to go down. If you've got things that you'd like to share about concerns you have with deployment of AI and how it's going to affect you or your team or your customers, and you want to talk about it, pop on by our free Slack group. Go to trustinsights.ai slash analytics for marketers, where you and over 3,000 other human marketers are asking and answering each other's questions every single day. We have not yet deployed an AI chatbot in there yet, but perhaps someday we will. Uh, and wherever it is you're watching or listening to the show, if there's a place you'd rather have instead, go to trustinsights.ai slash TI podcast, where you can find the show on most major platforms. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you.